Well, I really want to thank you for being here. I know it's been a long day for some of you. And I uh, again want to thank Hank for his kind invitation and for making my presence here possible. I've been a member of this organization for 25 years. I first heard about it uh, 32 years ago. Uh, I was in Canada. And basically, personally, I wasn't really into religion. I grew up with parents that were pretty much liberal, never telling us to go to church on Sundays particularly. And I did my studies in molecular biology, and throughout these years, I never really grasped the concept of Darwinism and evolution. So when I first heard about uh, Raelianism, I said, okay, that's nice. And I continued on my journey, my spiritual quest, if you will. And it's only seven years after, during, after this uh, quest that I met Rael. I attended his seminars, and it was basically the turning point for me. What you're about to see um, is the extraordinary story of a man's close and physical encounter with an extraterrestrial human being uh, that happened in 1973, uh, during which time he was given a message to spread around the world. And today, 40 years later, Rael is still alive, uh, and his message hasn't changed one bit, still the same. And I have brought some books. He wrote a book called Intelligent Design, Message from the Designers, and all the details of the magnitude of the message that he received are laid out in this extraordinary book. The presentation consists of two videos, one which lasts about eight minutes, uh, which encapsulates, if you will, the essence of the, of the Raelian philosophy. And the second video is a shorter one in which Rael speaks for two minutes about uh, his encounter. I don't need to hope that you will watch these two videos with an open mind, because I already sense you, you have that. Uh, and also with a set, set of space age, uh, because we are in the age of science today. And uh, then I'll be coming back after the two videos are presented. Thank you. I know exactly what question you are dying to ask me, and I will answer it right now. There is no incontrovertible physical evidence that Rael had this encounter. None. And the good news is I'm not here to try to convince any of you of any of it. Because it's not about the messenger. It's about the message. It's not about believing in the messenger, but more about understanding the message. Because belief and understanding are two separate worlds. Uh, primitive, superstitious people used to believe the Earth was flat. Today, except of course for the members of the Flat Earth Society, I would say it's fair to say that the majority of the world understands that the Earth is round, thanks to science. And you know, being an atheist, and rejecting the idea that a mystical and almighty God created all life on Earth does not necessarily make Darwinism or the evolution theory the last theory standing. It's not, it's not really the case because there are other theories out there. And the fact is, if, if since the discovery of DNA back in 1953 by Crick, Watson, and Rosalind Franklin, and more so, I would say, in the past three decades, there's been an explosion of scientific knowledge. And we have witnessed extraordinary breakthroughs, particularly in the field of biological sciences. For instance, we now understand that every living cell in our body is extremely complex. And we understand that each of these cells contains many of what I call ultra-sophisticated molecular machines. I mean, the level of sophistication and precision 
is not only mind-boggling, but breathtaking. It's like another universe down there. And I guess Rumi was right when he said, do not feel alone because the entire universe is inside of you. But suffice it to say that when one understands this level of complexity, of precision, of sophistication, of harmony that happens at that molecular level, it becomes pretty difficult to dismiss the idea that, hey, there's an intelligent design at work here. In fact, many prominent scientists who used to believe in Darwinism now embrace or rather reject the idea that evolution accounts for all the species that we see and instead embrace the intelligent design theory. Now the difference between that intelligent design model and the Raelian intelligent design model is that these scientists will define the designer as the singular God that we know. So we're, uh, this is just taking us back to the creationism by a God theory. Whereas in the Raelian model of intelligent design, we're talking about designers, and I insist on the plurality. That means that life, a group of scientists, human scientists, came here on Earth at a time when there was no life, and through the use of uh, DNA and genetic engineering, scientifically engineered all life forms on Earth, including humans whom they created in their image, as the Bible says. Now, one aspect that I find perhaps the most beautiful about this explanation is that this group of humans who came here on Earth, as the video outlined, was composed of scientists, artists, men, women, and representatives of every original seven races. So suddenly, we no longer have this male, white, God model, but we have a pluralistic explanation. Both genders, we have a mixture of scientists and artists, because you really need the artists to create the beauty and not just make it just scientific. And anybody now on Earth can look at this model and look at the sky and identify with one of the creators. Um, so this is, uh, in a nutshell, the Aurelian message. And I hope that you will have the ability one day or anytime soon to read Rael's book and make your own opinion. Because as I said earlier, the idea is not to convince or recruit people, but just to put the information out. Even if after reading the book you think, after all, it's a great science fiction book, at least you'll understand who the Elohim are and why we find it so important to uh, reach our third goal, which is building an embassy or the third temple in Jerusalem to welcome the Elohim back on earth. And as they told Rael, they will come back with all the prophets as announced by every religion on earth. Now, I said this was the third most important point or goal. The second goal, obviously, is to spread that message all around the world in preparation for the arrival of the Elohim on Earth. But that can only happen if we continue to spread what our first goal is, which is love. The Elohim cannot come back on Earth if there are still wars, if there is still violence, they want to feel that we are capable as a human race, no matter what our differences are, to get along, to work together, and to prepare for that fantastic day when they will officially return to Earth. So it's simple, maybe too simple, but it's in simplicity, I think, that you can reach out the maximum number of people. Because then that's how the Elohim wanted it. They didn't want a messenger to spread a very complex and, and complicated message. Because in our organization, we have people from all walks of life, all professions, all genders, 
sexualities. Uh, that's why it's so attractive to many of the young generation, you know, who no longer seem to find uh, what they're looking for in terms of existential uh, answers to our very existence here on Earth. And the other thing is that the Ruralian movement is 100% pro-science. So we have nothing to do with mysticism because at the end of the day, science, the role of science is to demystify. And only through this demystification process can we understand the nature of things. Only through this demystification process can we understand where we human beings fit in the big picture? But it's going to be a long road before the Elohim come. There's, uh, there's going to be a lot happening in, the, in, in terms of our society. Um, since 1945, we entered a critical phase in the development of this humanity. We entered the age of science after the explosion of the atomic bombs over Hiroshima and three days later over Nagasaki. That's when the Elohim started being concerned. That's when a lot, in fact, a lot of UFO sightings have been reported near nuclear test sites after these explosions because they were concerned with what we would be able to do with our technology. Just like a parent, a parent would be watching his child or her child play with a loaded gun, if you will, and at the same time be powerless because they don't want to come unless we invite them and the embassy is the invitation. So now, whether or not our society will evolve into a world post-human or a combination of humans and intelligent, artificial intelligent computers or machines re really remains, it's entirely up to us to decide what we're going to do with the novel technologies. But the most important is to not be afraid because at the end of the day, I think all of us can benefit from all the new technologies that are on the horizon and th that are bound to change our lives forever. If and only if these technologies are used altruistically rather than only for special interest groups. And when we start to understand the potential benefits of science, when we start to not fear science because our first reaction to any novel technology is always to react with fear and apprehension. But once we truly understand the benefits of technologies and understand that you know, we can save lives, we can create life, we can prolong life, we can improve our quality of life with those technologies, that's going to be marvelous. Uh, there is so much more to say about this organization, namely the notion of scientific immortality, I'd be happy to address that according to the message that Rael received um, through human cloning, uh, which Rael also wrote a fascinating book expounding on a vision of a future where technologies really help us go where we sh should go in a peaceful and responsible manner. But I will stop here and thank you again for being here. So we have time, yes, we have time for about three questions. I think I'm going to, you first and then Lincoln. I, I, I have a lot of questions, so it's hard to choose. Uh, but basically two um, that strike me as the most important. Um, so is there any information about the mistake that they made up there or on their own planet, uh, the genetical mistake that they made? Is there any information about that? And second is, so I, I always was in favor of all these astronaut theories, uh, you know, uh, I, I think it's very plausible. Um, <coughs> and it's, it's a beautiful explanation to why nature is so beautiful. I, I think it's a very beautiful explanation to that, that if there are designers. Uh, but then um, what strikes me uh, is th what's happening on their planet. Is it not beautiful at all uh, that they took up on the experiments of like making all these colors and beautiful shapes here? So basically, these two questions. Um, to the first question, which had to do with the mistakes, yes. They don't really expound too much except to say what you saw in the video, that that's what really prompted them to go and seek out uh, another planet on which they would create life. And it almost sounds to me like there's this uh, 
embedded desire. It's almost in, in us, in our code, to want to create life, to want to explore, uh, uh, you know, uh, our solar system, uh, our galaxy. Um, knowledge is infinite. And we are, are at a crossroads right now in terms of uh, whether we're going to use, um, you know, technologies for destructive or constructive purposes. It so happens that uh, on their planet, the mistakes that happened was consequential, and that's what the majority of the population uh, voted for them to stop their experimentations altogether or just to go on another planet. And this is one thing we have to keep in mind, is that as we evolve in our scientific knowledge of molecular genetics, for instance, our space program evolves as well. Right now, we're just uh, limited to the confines of the moon, for instance, and now we're sending probes to Mars, etc. But as far as man, uh, uh, space explorations, this is also evolving. So it seems like there's a parallel to be drawn as, as far as uh, scientific progress and progress in terms of, you know, uh, exploring uh, space. But uh, before I get to the second question, there's a really interesting uh, law that the, the Elohim shared with Rael. It's called a, a co it's a cosmic law, in which that says every time a civilization reaches a point where they're capable through their technology to travel in space, it also means that they've discovered energies enabling them to self-destruct if they misuse that technology. So, what are we going to do? Are we are we mature enough? to use this technology to our advantage to explore space because it's possible it's bound to happen you know if especially if if uh, we create ethics committees that are so controlling uh, some technologies are bound to go underground and if you have no control it's 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 more concerning if you will so if we misuse technology and, and make mistakes like they did it's very possible that we'll be forced to uh, go on another planet uh, if we don't destroy ourselves. Now, the second question, which had to do w with um, the beauty that we see here, what's going on on their planet. The Elohim explained that their planet is uh, in our galaxy, but not in our solar system. And they, their planet, as they call it, is the planet of eternal life, where they can live on average 1,000, up to 1,000 years, and then use an advanced human cloning technique combined with the technique of accelerated growth process wi in which just before they die, they upload their personality, character, um, uh, memories, all their individual traits onto a computer, then recreate a clone of themselves, a much younger in the younger body, then re-download that information so that the new individual doesn't have to start from scratch because it wouldn't make any sense to call it eternal life if each time you're recreated you have to start from scratch so this accumulation of knowledge and this technology enabling them to be eternals uh, also um, uh, has to do with the fact that they're 25,000 years according to the message more advanced technologically and more advanced than we are You t you're, you've mentioned how the future, from a Raelian perspective, is open to us to, to d determine. Um, what, does Raelianism take any positions on maybe what kinds of technologies we should pursue in the future, being that it's open? For example, I'm wondering in particular, would, they, would Raelianism be opposed to the use of evolutionary algorithms to, as a creative mechanism going into the future? Um, I think the only technology that Raelianism um, would be against is nuclear energy. Anything that has to do with potential destruction of the planet. All other technologies were pro. And um, we have to understand that um, creating these ethical committees uh, can be fine to a certain extent to make sure there's no abuse of uh, any new technology, but uh, as long as it doesn't slow down progress. But the nuclear, I mean, the, the, the biological weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons of mass destruction is what we are more concerned about. It's what we 
Israelians are more, and I'm sure other groups are more concerned about. It's what the Elohim are more concerned about because we could blow this planet in, in at the press of a button, right? And they don't want that to happen. But at the same time, they want us to, they give us free will, right? To decide our, our own destiny. And this is why spreading love and consciousness and awareness and changing perhaps the, the certain values like sharing, uh, certain values that really promote acceptance of the differences among uh, humans, uh, w which will, I think, help the process of uh, reaching that stage when uh, the Elohim see that we're ready uh, for them to return. Okay, last question from Randall here. Okay, it, it may be a two-part question. And I just wanted to say that I'm glad that you briefly addressed the matter of the cloning and how to upload and go into a clone, because I was wondering about that when we talked earlier. But now I've got a new question, which is because you mentioned um, being careful about technologies that could destroy the earth, Correct. and then you mentioned ethical committees and things like that, but it sounds from how you describe the religion itself that it kind of teaches from the Elohim that every time when there was a law that was put down to not do something, that they always ended up going ahead and doing it anyway, which is almost a teaching of, well, you can have ethics commissions, but someone's going to do it anyway, so you might as well get prepared for the fact that it's going to happen. That is one thing that uh, it seems to me the teaching is. And then the other, which is maybe just more of a, I don't know if you find it funny or not, but it, it sounds to me like there's a lot in Raelianism that actually mirrors, if, you've, if you're a fan of the recent Battlestar Galactica series, <laughs> <laughs> and you've seen that they, they move from planet to planet and everything that has happened will happen again and they have uploading in it and everything. It just, it sounds like, was there a Raelian on the, um, in, in the group that made that series by any chance? I or don't believe so. You don't know? I'm not sure which series you're referring to, but okay. it's, uh, it's nice. I, uh, in, in reference to um, your first question, which had to, I'm sorry, which had to do with uh, ethics, committees. ethics committees, yes. Um, Yes, uh, I think that if, there, if, the, if there's always a potential risk I mean, for abusing a technology and uh, for it to go regardless underground, even if it's, uh, if it's accepted by the majority. Because uh, I think that at the same time, we have to be very careful about people who want to take uh, you know, a science into their own hands and just start you know, performing experiments and not be sort of regulated right, in terms of uh, how far they can go with their exper experimentation. Yes, there will always be people who want to push the envelope and, and, and do things differently and, and not listen to whatever committee is out there uh, outlining the regulations. Uh, at the same time, we have to, uh, they're explaining that their model of uh, society is based on geniocracy, where um, only geniuses, only people who have the ability to uh, make decisions, who have a certain level of intelligence, uh, can actually uh, decide how to um, guide their society uh, and, and how to use science for, to make sure that everybody can benefit, right? Because right now we have a political system that's more mediocratic, if you will, than democratic. And uh, the politicians really are not serving the people. Uh, we, we elect people, but they're not really s for our own uh, best interest. They're very selfishly oriented and, and you know, bought out by special interest groups, etc. So the political system actually is very flawed the way it is right now with only, there's basically only two parties uh, here anyway in America. Um, we need some fresh blood, we need some young blood, we need some new ideas, we need some pro-science individuals, not, uh, not individuals that allow their religious beliefs to come in the way uh, you know, of uh, legislations, for instance. So there's a lot of change that we're gonna, changes that we're going to go through, and it's a step-by-step -step process, and um, we're just hoping we're gonna step in the right direction, and one that will, again, uh, be uh, leading the world population to world peace and, uh, and, and universal love, if you will. Thank um, you. Thank you very much.